and welcome to What Goes Up, a weekly markets podcast. My name is Mike Regan. I'm a senior editor at Bloomberg. And I'm Valdana Hayek, a cross-asset reporter with Bloomberg. And this week on the show, well, 2022 is almost ready for its place in the history books. And for investors, eh, it'll be a pretty ugly chapter. Stocks, bonds, crypto, you name it. Pretty much all investments suffered this year as the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to quell historic inflation. So what does 2023 have in store? We'll get into it with the head of investment strategy for the Americas at a big investment firm who is kind enough to break out her crystal ball for 2023. I hope she has a crystal ball. I think on. she has one. She yeah. has one. OK. Yeah. yeah. How, you know, how about you, Vildana? It's very uh, it's that time of year to get very reflective. Mm -hmm. uh, do your year end evaluation. Have you I done, did, your, I have did you done mine, your yeah. self evaluation? Yeah, yeah, of course. Wait, what, I, 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 how'd you do? How'd I you... spoke so highly of myself. Oh, you did? Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would say if they were to ask me for some input. For that, I would be mostly positive, but I would have to say, um, when it comes to our game show, uh, in the craziest things segment of the podcast, the the price is precise. Performance has been a little lackluster. It's been so bad. It's it's been a little. I've lackluster. won three or four times, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I should know. go back and keep track of yeah. how many times I've won. I've won more times than you have. Well, I'm the host. I'm the host. Yeah, I, yeah. You I, give means I win. I, I win every time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's not fair. But the good news is, I I feel like it's kind of been my fault that the the uh, topics have been out of your wheelhouse. So just to boost your year end performance, I've got one that's squarely in your wheelhouse this week, just for you. Is it about Taylor Swift? No. Oh, is that yours? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a tease too. <laughs> you just gave it away. All right. And I hear our guest has something really great prepared for craziest things in markets. So I do want to bring her in. It's Gargi Chaudhry. She's head of iShares Investment Strategy, Americas. And I'm so happy that she's joining us today. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Gargi. Hi, guys. It's so great to be here. Thank you, Mike and Mildana, for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And maybe just to start out, you can tell us uh, about your role at BlackRock and what it entails. Sure, of course. So um, I run a team of uh, investment strategists. The the what that means in um, <laughs> plain English language is we tell our clients who invest with iShares ETFs how to think about the market. So, you know, obviously you guys were talking about what a historic year this has been, but what does that mean? Where does that create opportunities? And what is the macro environment telling us? You know, taking the, everything, the data, the policy, the geopolitics, and turning that into investable themes with iShares ETF. So that's what my team and I do. And then also we try to get a sense of how people are positioned. What are the flows telling us? Is there an area of the market that flows should have gone to and didn't? So a lot of macro research, implementation ideas, and research. Yeah. Yeah, Gargi, we'd very much look forward to getting your outlook for 2023. But even in the more near term, boy, we have a big week ahead of us next week. Mm -hmm. you know, Federal Reserve meeting, uh, CPI data. You know, I think uh, everyone is sort of has their fingers crossed under the assumption that the Fed will downshift uh, its rate hikes to 50 basis points. What, what are you expecting for next weekend? Is there anything you're worried about surprising uh, in either the CPI or the, or the Fed uh, decision? Love that question. Thank you. So I think next week will probably be all about inflation. I know we want it to be about the Fed, but I think it'll be about inflation. As of right now, the market is expecting, a, again, one more week-ish CPI print. So think about perhaps a 0.3 on core. I think anything that looks higher than that, so if we get another 0.4 or even a strong 0.3 with a strong core X shelter. So remember now the market will be extremely focused on that core X shelter piece because Chair Powell has brought that up and now we're going to be just uniformly focused on that one line item. And I think if we get a stronger than expected number on that core X shelter, I think that could negatively impact risk sentiment. So I think, uh, you know, inflation is something that I've focused on my whole career. So I'm kind of excited to, to deep dive into that data. And then with the Fed, uh, I think a 50 basis point is baked in. I think a Chair Powell told us as much at the Brookings. But um, more important than that 50 basis points is actually how they project their SEP forecast. So what are they telling us about the path of policy for the next two years? How are they uh, tell guiding us about inflation? So really breaking down the SEP forecast uh, for next year, I think that's going to be really important. And also how Chair Powell 
uh, is perceived from a hawkish perspective. Again, remember, the, the market at first breathed a huge sigh of relief, uh, at least after uh, November 30th, that he didn't push back on the easing of financial conditions. So is Chair Powell going to be a little bit more hawkish this time around at the December meeting? I don't think so, but I think that's what the market's going to fo- focus on. To what extent does he talk about uh, double-sided risks versus to what extent does he talk uh, just about, uh, you know, more needs to be done. So that's what I'll be looking at. And I know you have these different themes that you laid out in your year ahead outlook, and I, I want to get to those. But just while we're talking about the Fed, another thing you had said in your outlook is that Fed easing is unlikely in 2023 because inflation will keep persisting, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. That's actually really one of the core themes as we think about the market for the next year. This idea that we're already pricing in some cuts for the end of 2023, I think is a little bit optimistic. I think the Fed has told us again and again, now whether the market wants to believe it or not, but the Fed has told us again and again that they are looking to keep rates higher for longer. That's what they want. And our view is, at least, that uh, both core CPI and PCE inflation, which, as we know, the Fed looks at, you know, it's their preferred measure to look at PCE, uh, both of those will stay significantly above the 2% target. And in a world where unemployment is still, you know, at this juncture, much below 4%, it's at 3.7%, and looking ahead probably still remains uh, much below their assumption of Nehru, I think it's a little too optimistic to expect meaningful eases for 2023. I think we get to five, maybe five and a quarter, and then just stop. We let the monetary policy and its lagged effects work. Um, and, you know, the market prices that in sometimes and then comes all the way back and then the Fed pushes back and they price that, that in and then come all the way back. So I think there's a little bit of that tug, and, tug of war with the markets and the uh, pricing of, of policy for the remainder of the year. But I doubt that they are going to cut 50 or so basis points before the, you know, maybe in 2024, but I doubt that'll happen this year. Maybe one at the end of the year, but no more than that. Well, it's a great point. You know, we've all been conditioned to sort of assume that Fed policy is joined at the hip to that 2% inflation target. But is there sort of, you know, some space between those now where, uh, you know, the Fed may no longer think of 2% as mission accomplished? You know, if they get that PCE or core PCE actually below the level of the Fed funds rate, but but higher than uh, 2%. Is is that sort of mission accomplished for them, do you think? So, you know, there's this view in the markets that a few a few of the, uh, you know, a few people have spoken about, and I believe I heard this um, at, in one of your uh, other podcasts um, as well, that, you know, the Fed may revise up their uh, target to something significantly above two. I don't think that will happen. I don't think they're going to revise it meaningfully higher. And I think, you know, every time the chair gets asked about their flexible average inflation targeting, their fate policy, remember how much we obsessed about yeah, that yeah, yeah. in the pre-pandemic era uh, when inflation was below 2%. Um, so I, I don't think they'll revise it how, uh, higher. However, what I think will happen is that even before inflation gets back to below 2%, the Fed will pause on their rate hiking path. They will do that because they will have seen significant improvement on the path of policy. So we'll, you know, just in this next month CPI print, which will come out next week, I think we'll already see a headline CPI coming down to a seven handle. So that's significantly lower than the nine-ish percent that we saw. Core inflation will probably come down to just about six. May, I mean, if we're lucky, maybe a 5.9, but just about six, I think. And then as we look towards, you know, May of next year, I think it's likely that we could see sort of a high three, like a 3.7 or so. So it's a lot of progress from where we've come from, but it's not the 2% that they're looking for. And I think they have to be okay with that as long as the direction of travel is in the right direction. So if the direction of travel, especially on a core X of shelter, is in the right direction, I think they will definitely be okay to pause, but not ease. And then let's talk a little bit more about what you're seeing for 2023, because in your guide for next year, you say that the investing regime we have long known has changed. And then you lay out your themes. So maybe you can just walk us through your thinking. 
Sure. Thank you for bringing up the invest- investment guide. So we uh, published that uh, last week on November 30th. It is our themes for 2023. And I think it's particularly exciting. Well, I would think so because my team and I, you know, spend a lot of time and effort on this. But I think it's particularly exciting thinking about 2023 now because of the rough year that 2022 was like no doubt unless you were in cash and if you were privileged enough to be in cash um, if you were in any other part of the market I guess outside of energy you've had a really tough go at it and I think while we sort of uh, swallow that it has also created this incredible opportunity for the year ahead. And, and nowhere is that more prevalent than in the fixed income markets. And we spend a lot of the report actually talking about that. But broadly, you know, as you lay out, Dana, one of the things that we, we start off talking about is how this next six to 12 months, and, you know, we're not looking past that, but at least the next six to 12 months is going to be very different than the previous a regime of a very accommodative central bank that is poised to cut rates at any hint of an economic slowdown. And I think we are now grappling with a central bank, or for that matter, we're grappling with a capital market where interest rates are higher for longer. And that is the new normal. It is not the lower for norm, uh, lower for longer that we had gotten used to, which of course, you know, had its own ramifications on where in the equity market you want to invest or what that means for returns and fixed income. I think understanding that for the near term with inflation remaining above the Fed's target, that rates are going to stay high and where you should allocate to is really profound. And that's what we're focused on on the Investor Guide. So how do, are we thinking about sort of the growth versus value trade in that scenario? Um, you know, is, is it time to keep in that value and, and sort of everything but tech and growth basket uh, going into 2023? Absolutely, Mike. That's actually our, you know, second theme. Our first theme, which I'm, ho- I'm hopeful that we'll talk a little bit more about, is the role of bonds in a portfolio and how it's significantly shifted uh, this year and will be much more meaningful in 2023. But our second theme is around this idea that, you know, whenever I'm talking to clients and they're looking to hear our views on the equity market, they always want to know around, you know, when should I get back into the growth trade? And historically, obviously, you know, uh, when we've gone gone into slowdown periods where we've either been forecasting a recession or we've been in a recession, growth has obviously led the way. But that's been because that's always the time when the Fed steps in and cuts rates meaningfully, uh, sometimes even bringing real rates to negative territory. And that has been very, very beneficial for the growth part of the equity market. But this time, it's a new regime where at least, again, for the next six to 12 months, the Fed has told us over and over again that they are keeping rates at a higher level for longer. And that's actually better, we think, for the value segments of the market. So um, at least for the near term, till we expect the Fed to start to cut rates, to begin on their cutting cycle, which we do not think is going to be the case this year, We think that value, much like this year, will outperform in a higher rate regime. Now, we can certainly, and if this does happen, if we feel like the economy is slowing down much more meaningfully or inflation has come back down much more meaningfully than is our base case or our forecast right now, of course, that could shift if the Fed were to begin to cut rates back down um, to zero or even just back down to 2% or something like that. But that is not the call right now. I think we are going to at least for the next few months, actually see higher interest rates from the Fed, perhaps till the end of first quarter. And again, in that period, you want to be allocated to the value part of the equity market with tickers such as sort of, you know, IWD or IVE, which give you uh, that allocation to broader value segments of the market or something like a VLUE, which again is a value factor that gives you exposure to those deep value names. Uh, And we saw that this year. We saw sort of that outperformance of minimum volatility and uh, value. And to a certain extent, at least in the beginning of next year, I think that minimum volatility and value 
can outperform. And then by the end of next year, and you know, hopefully we can have another conversation then, but by the end of next year, if we do see that the Fed is stepping in and getting ready to ease rates, we can talk about if it's time to go into growth and where in growth. I think that'll be another exciting conversation. Not all growth will be behave the same way. There'll certainly be pockets of high quality tech, such as semiconductors, such as robotics, that'll do really well. And there'll be other pockets that will not. So can I ask you a follow up on this, which is so earlier this year, we we obviously had a couple of different rallies in the stock market that then sort of petered out. They they didn't end up holding. (laughs) And I think during one of the earlier ones, maybe sometime over the summer, we actually saw when we saw the rally happening, we saw a lot of speculative names also rallying meme stocks and tech versus what we're seeing now, where we are actually seeing some of those value names doing a little bit better. I'm just wondering if you think that that's a sign that maybe the rally is a bit stronger, more broad based versus just seeing, you know, tech coming back for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think there have been seven periods this year when uh, the market and when I say market, I mean, IVV, just the broad index S&P 500 has rallied over 7%. And we actually saw that n- not not including the last couple of days, but from October 12th to sort of the beginning of this week. Um, We saw another massive rally in the market. And a lot of that is actually around the pricing in of a pivot, right? So every time that has happened, and obviously the most recent one was because of the CPI number, followed by the last day of November when the Fed spoke at um, at the Brookings Institute on November 30th. And again, that was all pricing in a pivot of policy. And of course, if you're pricing in a pivot of policy, you do have sort of that growth-led uh, rally. And you also have the, you know, what's been interesting to me is sort of the most shorted names that rally the most, because obviously that's where positioning is the most offsides. We also saw this back in the sort of the July to or June to August rally. Right. And that that rally was what, 17 percent, which ended right before the Jackson Hole uh, meeting. And again, we saw the same thing where there was a pivot uh, narrative getting priced in very prematurely. There's no pivot in sight for now. And again, you saw that those areas of the market that were probably the least owned uh, that were pricing in that pivot. And for now, this is not a pivot for now. The best we can get early next year is perhaps a pause. To me, a pivot means that the Fed is going to turn around and cut rates. We're not expecting that. And therefore, those value names, looking at a VLUE, looking at an IVE, looking at an IWD, really makes a lot of sense in a portfolio. And I'll be very honest, depending on how this data for CPI next week comes out, if we get another 0.2 or even a a 0.3, and if we get a core uh, services X shelter component which is the one that I was talking about earlier, having another sort of weakish print. It was a little less than 0.2 last month. If we have another 0.2 on core uh, services X shelter, I think that that can be a huge catalyst going into year end. Everyone wants the Santa rally. Um, that can be a catalyst uh, going into between now and the end of January. We can see that. But I don't think that's going to be a lasting rally because I think that earnings growth will probably get revised lower as we see many of the um, uh, analysts starting their revision for 2023. We're going to see that in the earnings season that is going to be with us in the end of January. So we can have a period of market rally for sure. It can be a relief rally, but it is not believed to be a growth led start of a new cycle. I think that is still far away from us. Well, thank you for defining pivot for us. It's funny how much debate there is over the meaning of the word pivot. Everybody uses it, it yeah, the without Fed. defining it. I think it's the the basketball players that are messing everything up. Yeah, because you can That's pivot. That. You can mm-hmm. pivot in basketball mm-hmm. without doing a full <laughs> one. <laughs> Just throw that out there. One really interesting point you make in this look ahead piece is uh, bonds are back. Yeah, who would have ever thought? Who would have ever thought we'd be talking about bonds as a and, and you, have a, you have a great acronym for it. I think it's BARB. It's BARB. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we went from Tina to BARB. Thank you Barb? for picking What's up Barb? on that. Bonds are back. <laughs> Bonds are back. 
Bonds are back. Oh, okay. Oh, bonds, all right. All right. All yeah, right. bonds are back. So we, you know, lived in a decade and a half of the of the Tina world, which of course we know is there is no alternative. And now we are about to embark upon, and actually we have embarked upon it since I first started talking about this barb, or actually the first thing that I was talking about a lot was um, I called it the yield of dreams. So it was our <laughs> yield of dreams that we were getting when you could earn about six and a half percent in something like an IGSB, which gives you uh, exposure to the one to five year part of uh, investment grade corporate credit. And to earn over six percent was the stuff of dreams, because remember, not that long ago, we were going out into high yield and emerging markets to earn that. We've lived through that not that long ago. So we remember what it's like to crave yield and live in a world where there is no alternative but to go out of the risk spectrum. And now it is so exciting, I think, to be in a world where there are some incredible opportunities staying very high in quality, short in duration in the fixed income markets and on yields that we could have only dreamed about because bonds are back, because it's barb. And I'm talking two-year treasuries here. I'm talking one to five-year IG credit, something like an IGSV or something like an SHY, or even mortgages, something like an MBB, which can earn you about 4.6% yield without taking, again, too much credit risk, staying very up in quality, and earning significant yield in your portfolio, and especially having that in a world where, um, you know, growth is going to slow down. Now, whether we're immediately going to fall into a recession or not, you know, we don't know. I think the signs are showing a recession. Um, but even without all of that, I think owning bonds in your portfolio where you've historically been 60-40 to equities, I wonder if you're supposed to be 60-40 to bonds. Right. Well, the uh, let's unpack a little mm. bit. You're thinking on the uh, the MBB, the uh, the uh, MBS ETF. You yeah, know, I I feel like uh, when people hear mortgages, uh, <laughs> you know, there's there's a little there's bit of a, a flashback, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and a little bit of a fear. And and in that scenario you laid out, where if we do have, uh, you know, a, a sort of a deeper recession than people are worried about, if we do see that uptick in unemployment and delinquencies and defaults. How risky is our mortgages, do you think, in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, I completely hear you. And look, it's very natural for us to always go to, it's it's a human bias, right? We Our brain sort of goes to the last period that we can recall whenever we he hear the word housing, we think re great financial crisis. And I completely hear that. And I would say that the dynamics of the housing market now, the dynamics of the mortgage market now are so different from what 2007 was because 2007 taught us some very good, hard earned lessons around what it means to have, uh, you know, a stronger, more regulatory induced uh, mortgage market. And all of that had has led us to a world now where, of course, it's much more difficult to get mortgages. The, uh, the, the way in which the mortgage market is set up is a lot more different. And also, just from a structural perspective, I think, look, our housing price is going to come back, come back lower from here, for sure. I think we are going to see, uh, see some of that. And Mark, as you uh, point out, you know, if unemployment rate does go up from here, let's say it goes up another percent or so, we get up to the mid fours, which is probable over the next year. Uh, I, I, is it possible to see further pressure on the housing market? Absolutely. But does that mean that we're going back to the foreclosures and exactly the same kind of outcome that we saw in 2007? The answer is no, because it's a structurally different market. There's a lot less supply of uh, homes, a lot more demand. Uh, there is a lot more people that are entering that 30 to 35 age bracket in the U.S. that will be needing to form households that will need to own homes. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, thinking back to 2007, I mean, there was forced selling in the mortgage space. 
right? When we remember back to what was happening to the Ginny Mays and the Fannie Mays of the world, there was forced selling of mortgages, which will not take place this time around. These are all government-sponsored entities already. Um, and when you're sort of allocating to that space, especially right now, when you're looking at mortgages, you know, one of the risks, if you will, every asset class has a risk, right? So one of the risks that you are that, that you would normally face is your prepayment risk, right? So that is, you, you know, you've got your credit risk, you've got your interest rate risk, and you've got your prepayment risk. And your prepayment risk usually in mortgages comes about why homeowners are able to refinance and pay down their existing mortgage, refinance into a lower rate and prepay their mortgage. When mortgage rates are where they are, the number of people that can refinance is about 90% below where they were pre-pandemic. So that prepayment risk isn't really there given what mortgage rates are doing. I don't think any of us are refinancing right. our home right now. Well, it would go, going forward, you, you would have to assume that the Fed does hold steady and doesn't engage in a big rate cutting campaign, I guess, to, you know, to, to eliminate that risk. Yeah. And, and and again, I come back to the, the what are my assumptions here uh, and the assumptions that I build, that my team and I build our forecast uh, on are that, number one, inflation remains above the Fed's target of 2%. In fact, meaningfully above the Fed's target of 2% on PCE for the next six, six to 12 months. We think it's going to be closer to 3% instead of 2%. Uh, by the end of 2023. Another assumption that we build this on is, and it's related to number one, is that as a result of inflation remaining high, the Fed will not start a campaign of cutting rates aggressively back to zero. You know, we're going to see five, five and a quarter, and then a pause, and just a pause and a hold, which is actually very beneficial for fixed income owners because you're earning your coupon, you're earning that income of fixed income, which we haven't seen in these meaningful um, Amount since the early 90s. So to your point, yeah, I mean, now if we were to believe that the Fed is going to go back to bringing rates down by two, 300 basis points, which would start that refinancing cycle, absolutely. I think that would we would think rethink this view altogether. But also remembering that uh, MBB does have a interest rate sensitivity, it does have duration, if you will, of near seven years. So you will benefit from having that interest rate duration. But of course, there's going to be that prepayment and that's going to come in as well. And what about places to not be in in 2023? Because I know you said recently cash had uh, done well uh, this year, obviously, but that at this point, it's not exactly the best place to be going forward, right? I mean, yeah, cash has done um, done well this year. I would say that I think the time to step out of cash has come. I think that especially given what you're earning in the very front end of the very high quality treasury market. So right now, if you're in one to three year treasuries, you're earning, call it, you know, as of today, 4.3%. Um, you know, as of just a few weeks ago, it was closer to five. I think it's entirely possible after the Fed meeting, if they push back on pricing just a little bit, you're going to get some incredible opportunity to ease back into the front end of the market with an ETF ticker like SHV or SHY and, uh, you know, uh, uh, enjoy some of the incredible yield that you're earning there. And I would say that... Um, when we have that yield, when we have that incredible yield in the front end of the market, you don't really need to sit in cash. You sh can be on, you can be in duration of one to three years. You're not taking on a lot of interest rate risk. You're not taking on any credit risk. So why be in cash if you can earn so much more just stepping out of cash just a little bit? So, you know, cash certainly had a role to play and probably could still as a, uh, maybe like a mitigator to risk, but at one year and two year treasuries yielding what they do, I think the time to step out of cash has has arrived. Wow, Gargi Chaudhry, head of investment strategy for the Americas at iShares. Fascinating conversation. Any guest who comes on and refuses to make a prediction, I'm going to reference back to this episode and say, you can do it. Just have a little confidence and do it. All right. I think it's that time, Vildana. It's time for you 
to improve your year end evaluation for yes. me. Yes. yes. Which which I know you care so much about. I do care. <laughs> I want I want to win. You know the price is precise. Competitions, okay. obviously. All right. Well, let's yeah. bring it on. It's the it's the craziest thing we saw in markets this week. Why don't you go first? So there's this great story this week out about FTX and Taylor Swift having been in talks for a sponsorship deal worth more than a hundred million dollars. Oh my goodness! And the talks fizzled out. I guess just a couple months before FTX collapsed, there was going to be NFTs involved somehow, like. Ticketing? Of course. Oh, of course. yeah, of course, of course there would have to be. One, and, one would assume there'd be NFTs involved. Yeah, of course. And and Sam Bankman-Fried, FTX Sam Bankman-Fried, he favored the deal because he's a fan of, quote, Tay-Tay. <laughs> <laughs> who, who isn't? Who isn't, of course. Well, yes. Gargi, you know, we didn't get into crypto, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, as someone from a uh, ETF company, you know, h- where your head is at on crypto? You know, what were you bullish about the potential for some more crypto uh, ETFs? Were you sort of agnostic? And, and how are you thinking about it now? I think the underlying blockchain technology is something that is going to be with us. Um, I'm going to sound like uh, a very old person when I say this, but I personally (laughs) don't own any crypto and I've been happy to see that. But I'll also say what I notice is how many clients ask me about crypto. And honestly, 2022, the number is zero. If if there's so much (laughs) happening in the markets with bonds and inflation and geopolitical risk and a war and front end bonds earning you 5%, I don't think anyone is really too concerned about crypto right now. I think that was very different in 2021. Got a few questions that year for sure. Yeah, right, right. That's true. That talk about, you know, they were the answer to there is no alternative. Well, maybe there's this, but... Uh, you know, to your point, if treasuries at the front end are paying four or five percent, I don't know. Even the the yield schemes and the yield farming schemes are now many of them lower than the yields on treasuries. And which, more, much, many more people are much more scared of them now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For good reason. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, uh, Gargi, how about you? What's the craziest thing you've seen recently? Okay, so there's so many. The first one that I've been absolutely <laughs> obsessed with all of 2022 is supply chains. And just the clogging of supply chains that happened. And, you know, we all were very familiar with how much it costs to ship a container, 40 cubic foot container from Shanghai to L.A. So it's been really just over the last two months, it's been incredible to see that there are no ships stuck outside the port of L.A. that's gone from 107 to zero. So just seeing the unclogging of supply chains and what that might mean for goods inflation Ha- especially when this was such a big concern for for the last 12 months before that. I think that has been incredible. Um, just understanding the truck driver shortage in this country and the huge impact that that has on our day-to-day. And thankfully, that's especially as we go into the holidays, I think that's been incredible to have that sorted out and, and avoiding some of the strikes, et cetera. So that's something that People don't think about impacting markets, but I think it has a profound implication on markets. So that's one crazy thing that happened and thankfully got resolved. And then the other yeah. one um, is something that I was looking at recently, but just the amount of um, options that are trading in the market that are within a 24-hour expiry. So people buying one-day options is about 40% of total options traded, which is insane. Mm. That went up wow. from, I think the number was somewhere around, you know, call it uh, 15% or so in the pre-pandemic regime to about 43% now. Uh, and that's why you see it's... such big one-day moves. Like when the market moves 1%, you're pretty sure it's going to move 2 or 3 because of, right. of this dynamics. So that's another crazy thing that I've been noticing that has been going on in the markets. Is, is that the, you know, the YOLO retail Reddit crowd, do you think, to, to driving that? I think it's just this uh, understanding of or it's a manifestation of a higher volatility regime that we've entered into. If we look at where the VIX has been trading or even the move index, for that matter, people trying to capitalize on that. So I don't want to attribute this to any one type of investor. I want to attribute it to what's happening in the markets with respect to volatility being so high. And I hope that we will see a decline of that. And maybe some of this behavior will go away. But I think for all investors, um, investors that are trading for themselves, 
themselves or institutional investors, I think it's important to know that this is a phenomenon in the market. And when you're seeing price action, that you can attribute some of that to what's happening in the options market as well. Um, I, I cannot imagine that this 40% stat is going to remain in all of 2023. I would expect it to come down, but I don't think it'll go back down to the pre-pandemic levels of 15%. I think Argy wins because she brought two things. <laughs> Two things. Yeah, yeah, she doubled up. She doubled up. All right, you're allowed to double dip, though. I, we'll, we'll allow. They're both good ones. Both good ones. Yeah, but... the options stat is mind-blowing. All right. Well, it's your turn to win now, Vildana. I've got faith in you on this one. Uh, as as you know, Gargi, maybe you don't know, but my favorite asset class is ridiculous, ridiculous collectible items. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you allocate to that. I, I, I'm like... Some people do 60 40 bonds. I do like 90. 90% ridiculous collectibles. And 10% so, what? Uh, um, FTT whatever. token? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that goes in the first bucket. Yeah, that's, that's a collectible at this point. A Harry Potter fan who received an exclusive edition of the first J.K. Rowling book after entering a published company competition. Is putting it up for auction, Vildana. So you and I'm bidding on it. I think you're actually going to bid on this. Yeah. This is the, if if this is Vildana's wheelhouse. Gargi's is Harry Potter books. Anyway, this is courtesy of the Press Association uh, in in Great Britain. Child care practitioner. I I don't know what a child care practitioner is. A babysitter, I guess, or a nanny. Hmm. Chloe Esselmont was 16 when she entered the competition, having to write a letter explaining in no more than 50 words why she loved Harry Potter. So I feel like you could have entered that competition. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, and she won. She won a leather-bound special 15th anniversary edition of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which is published exclusively for the competition and signed by none other than author J.K. Rowling. So the question is, uh, when this goes up for auction at Hanson's Library Auction in Staffordshire on December 16th, what do you suppose... The auction house expects the winning bid to be. You forgot to say we're playing the prices. Uh, and, and, and I regret to inform you, Gargi, I'm going to need a bid from you as well, because this, <laughs> this is our game show. The price is precise. Gargi, I'm going to make you go first. What do you think the expected winning bid in British pounds is for a 15th anniversary leather bound edition author signed Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? And a reminder... It's not always a ridiculous, outrageous amount. Amount. Okay. But uh, let, well, let me give you one more bit of a um, of little bit of color on here. Uh, Hanson's book expert, Jim Spencer, who has won global recognition for rare Harry Potter finds, uh, you know, <laughs> global recognition for rare Harry Potter finds, said he had never seen an example of a book like this. Technically, he said, this is the rarest Harry Potter book I've ever handled, and I've assessed hundreds. Okay. Okay. So- Cash isn't as cheap as it used to be. So I am going to say (laughs) there's a little bit of tightening of financial conditions that has happened. So my answer would have been different last year. I'm going to say $15,000. $15,000. Way above. Way, way above. It it is in British pounds, but it's 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 pretty much much the same. It's pretty much the same these days. So I'm I'm going with two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Two hundred and fifty thousand. Heck yeah! British Great British. I'm <laughs> putting this bid. You in. are a Harry Potter bull. <laughs> yes. Forever. <laughs> Forever. I'm sorry, but you lose again. What? Gargi, that was a pretty good analysis. Gargi, no. she she took into financial conditions, <laughs> and and that is what that is the what's, way what's you got to the answer. Do it. They expect ten thousand pounds. Ah, oh, come book. on. But. As usual, they will get Vildana will get a call from this auction house. So please, I definitely thought please over bid 100, in our auction. I yeah, I kind of I would have sight unseen. I would have gone over a hundred thousand pounds. Good thing I'm not actually bidding on this because I would overbid. Wait, so I said fifteen thousand U.S. dollars, and you said it's ten thousand pounds. So I mean, I was close. <laughs> You're yeah. very close. So That's good. good. You're spot on. Thousand or so pounds. I love this. I, I'm j- I'm jealous. I'm ju- I'm jealous oh. of your ability to 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 win I, this. Well. She took into the tighter financial conditions, you know, and 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 Britain yeah, being sort exactly. of at the tip of the spear. There's a recession too, gotta, coming, guys. You gotta, yeah, yeah. That pound liquidity is yeah. not what it used to be. So. Oh come on, don't make me feel worse. <laughs> Just buy some bonds. Just buy some bonds. <laughs> <laughs> we, you, uh, here's a free idea for you. Just a uh, ETF that just buys Harry Potter books. 
What do you think? Me- free Harry one Potter for you. Mem- free one for you. You don't have to credit me for it. What would be the ticker? Uh, JK. Wand. Okay. Wand. <laughs> I was going to say JK. Oh. JK. <laughs> <laughs> but Wand is good. Wand is good. Wand is, Wand is really good. Yeah. W-A-N-D. <laughs> Uh, Gargi Chaudhry, uh, so great to hear your thoughts and catch up with you. Really enjoyed it, and I hope we can get you back again soon. I would love that. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gargi. What Goes Up? We'll be back next week. Until then, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal website and app or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you took the time to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts so more listeners can find us. And you can find us on Twitter. Follow me at Reganonymous. Vildana Hyrick is at Vildana Hyrick. You can also follow Bloomberg Podcasts at Podcasts. What Goes Up is produced by Stacey Wong. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs>